All right, thank you for joining us. Welcome to another session of Wacom webinars. Today, we have a special guest, Nick Orok, who is going to walk us through the process of creating a visual narrative for gaming. My name is Elizabeth Garcia, I'll be your host for today. Please use the Q&A on Zoom to ask your questions. This webinar will last around one hour. And Nick will be also taking time to answer your questions if you have any. So please, again, use the chat or the Q&A to send me your questions. This webinar is brought to you by Wacom Canada. We're better together and we're better with digital tools when we go back to school with Wacom. Please go check out the back to school offers and discounts we have. And also go check out Wacom Canada on YouTube. We have a brand new community, not on YouTube, I meant Instagram. We have a brand new Instagram for Wacom Canada. So please go check it out and give them a follow so you can see everything we're doing regionally in Canada. And if you haven't checked out already, please go to our social media channels and see the new Cintiq Pro 16. It is brand new. We launched it yesterday. And I encourage you to go see everything, all the updates that we've made to the Cintiq Pro 16. It's a beautiful, redefined, compact design for a Cintiq Pro line. Without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And here we have Nick. Hey, how's it going, Nick? Hey, Elizabeth, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining us today for a full hour of visual narrative for gaming. I would like um, for those of us in the audience who aren't familiar with your uh, career and your trajectory for you to give us a brief intro before you dive in. For sure. Um, first off, thank you all for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's always fun doing these little seminars. Um, so my name is Nick Orock. Um, I'm an advanced concept artist currently at uh, Warner Brother Games Montreal, uh, currently working on uh, Gotham Knights. Um, I'm part of a team of seven amazing illustrators and concept artists working together to basically generate and create content for this game and the world, uh, specifically in the environment team. Um, I've been in the industry for now close to 20 years in video games, but as a professional artist, I've been working for 24, 25 years. Um, I studied in illustration and design uh, in college here in my local town in Montreal uh, at Dawson College. And uh, upon graduating in 97, you know, just like every hungry student, I was very eager to find work as an illustrator. Uh, originally, my goals and intents uh, was to get into publishing, um, specifically designing book covers, um, maybe even get into graphic novels and whatnot. Um, that's what I aspire to. And I studied in traditional illustration, you know, um, but getting out into the field back in those days was a very big eye opener. Uh, it took at least a year for me to find my first job. Um, and that job basically was my first digital job. Um, and that's when I was introduced to the Wacom Intuos. I think it was probably the first generation, maybe the second. Um, and that was an eye opener and a game changer for me. Uh, Cause back in those days, not everybody had access to a computer, right? Um, it's only like studios, pardon me, that literally had the funds to, you know, have computers within their studio setups because they were very expensive back then. Um, so that's when I was introduced to digital artwork and uh, workflows and whatnot and uh, was doing digital illustration ever, literally ever since 1998. But prior to that, it was all acrylics, watercolors and oils. Oh, and airbrush too, which is super fun because I love being crafty. I love working with my hands, you know, 
uh, pushing my imagination to the limits and whatnot and my skill set. And uh, yeah, so um, fast forward five years later, um, got my opportunity to work in gaming. In gaming um, and it was actually at a time where uh, I was looking for work again. And a buddy of mine that I graduated with convinced me to pass an interview with Ubisoft Montreal. Um, I think at that point in time, there were only five years in operation when they first opened up studio or opened up shop here in Montreal. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much been moving forward since then. So I worked a total of about 15 years at Ubisoft. Uh, actually, no, about 14, yeah, 14, 15 years. Um, but after the four and a half years, I actually um, left for another company, a smaller studio, um, to work on a new IP. Um, and uh, basically was there for about four and a half years and then ended up returning back to Ubisoft for about nine and a half years. Um, and then after UB, basically ended up at Warner Brothers. Um, and that's where I've been ever since. So when you started, has your career always been um, focused in gaming or did you start in other, um, making art in other industries and then just sort of ended up in gaming later? It was uh, later on. Um, because for me, like when I first started off, my first opportunity was for a book pub publishing company. And um, if you'd like, I can actually show you, share my screen and I could show you guys um, the kind of work. Well, just an example, so to speak. Yeah, we would love to see um, sort of the stuff that you were doing at the very beginning. And then we can jump in uh, because guys, Nick will showcase some samples of production art and we'll, he will walk us um, sort of step-by-step step how he creates a narrative, uh, a narratively driven key art. And then he will also demonstrate how he customizes his tools um, to speed up his workflow. But right now he's gonna show us sort of how he started. So can you guys see this all? Yes. Um, clearly? Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this uh, is a blast from the past. Um, I originally got hired to work on a series of five, um, you know, like animal nature uh, books for kids. Um, and that's when I was introduced to Photoshop and digital painting. Uh, there's only three copies here because unfortunately I couldn't find the fourth and fifth one, <laughs> but kind of get the gist of it. So uh, because of my, my background in traditional painting, I really focused on hyper-realism um, or realism, right? And just to give an example of the kind of work I did as in school, like this is what I did traditionally with acrylics. Uh, this wasn't in school, but pretty much is it. You know, there's that, there's that one as well. So all this was done digital, uh, sorry, traditionally in acrylics. Um, so because of my strength and realism, they needed uh, an artist or several artists to basically, you know, help them deliver and ship these products. So after maybe two years or three years, I think it was about two years, uh, we finally shipped these little um, animal wildlife books. Um, and then from there, we ended up going on to a sports visual encyclopedia where, you know, they built up a team of 30 artists to ship this product. And it took about two years and a half. Um, and it was a product that basically covered every sports discipline in the world. So it was a really fun ride. It's a great learning experience. Um, not only on a technical level, but also on a sports level, discovering like activities in sports that I've never even heard of. Um, so it was a good time. Uh, so then following, you know, uh, this experience here at the publishing company um, with like basically, you know, us shipping this product, unfortunately, a lot of people got laid off because we delivered the product and um, that's when I decided to kind of take a break and move out west to British Columbia in Whistler, BC to live my dream as a snowboarder, spent the whole season out there and then came back to Montreal and decided to, okay, let's focus on career now. And uh, that's when one of my uh, good friends, long-term, you know, graduate friends from school, he got my, got me into, um, got my foot in the door in um, Ubisoft and, you know, from there it was like onwards. 
Um, so yeah, if you'd like me to show some examples, um, you can pretty much find most of this work on my art station. Um, so let's see, uh, here's some more traditional artwork. This is all in acrylics as well. So my first gig um, in the gaming industry wasn't necessarily as an illustrator or, or a concept artist, but rather a junior character texture artist. And uh, for about a year and a half, I worked on a, pro on a game that got canceled, um, but that you know happens in the industry. And that's what led me to my first AAA game, which was Prince of Persia Warrior Within. Um, can you tell so us, have... can you yes. tell us uh, for those folks who are watching who are like new to this, what is a texture, a character texture artist? What do they do? And that was your first gig there. Maybe yes. like people are wondering, how do I set my my first foot there, what kind of jobs? What does this job entail? Well, a texture artist um, back then is nothing like what it is today. Today, they're just like technical whizzes. Um, back in those days, uh, it was all, basically you have the UV map of a 3D mesh, right? So I was basically working on texturing um, characters. So these characters, um, You'd have to unwrap it. So it basically looks like a 2D cutout, like a sticker effect. And then you'd have to paint realistically or stylistically, you know, depending on what kind of game you're working on, um, what the model is gonna look like. So all textures, like the wrapping of the face, the clothing uh, was all hand painted in Photoshop. And because they needed someone who was really good at realism, um, that's how I ended up getting the job because of my painting skills. Um, so, you know, fast forward about maybe, uh, one and a half years later, because you know, back in those days, games were shipped pretty fast. It's not like nowadays with AAA games, like Assassin's Creed, which take anywhere from, you know, four to five years on a big production. Um, back then it was like a year to maybe a year and a half to ship something. Um, so that led me to, you know, pursuing, um, basically concept artwork and illustration work. Um, and it was actually because of Prince of per Persia Warrior Within that I, the, you know, the, the opportunities opened up for me when I was introduced to the first concept art team that was put together full time at Ubisoft. Um, before that, the title of a concept artist didn't really exist. It's like, it's a fairly new title. Because uh, in the past and like other industries, it's more like visual development, you know, illustrators, designers etc but the official title of a concept artist you know literally came to be maybe about 10 12 years ago maybe 15. Um, I mean I've come across like old school veteran concept artists at conventions and stuff like uh, uh, Ian McKaig uh, or McHugh I'm always confusing the two of them Ian McKaig is the guy who worked on uh, Star Wars he did all the characters fantastic gentleman and even him he was saying it's like it's amazing to be growing up and working in this industry in time and age because concept artists didn't exist as a title so we're like oh okay cool um so i pursued uh, a, a career path in concept art being an illustrator myself you know like i'm an artist i can draw i can design um after meeting um pretty sure everybody knows the guy he's just a legend um sparth aka nicolas bouvier a uh, famous concept artist who is art director at uh, 343 Studios um, on the Halo series. So that's where I met him, like close to maybe 18, 17 years ago. And uh, he's the one who set me on the path of like, what are you doing texturing? You know, like you're not a texture artist. Uh, after I showed him my portfolio, he goes, you're a concept artist. I'm like, okay. So... He was the one who uh, inspired me and pushed me to, to you know, pursue a, a career as, a, as an illustrator or concept artist. And um, so that's pretty much where I set my goals. Um, so, you know, when you're when you get hired at a company under a specific title and profile, it's it's a bit hard to actually transition into a new uh, title. Um, but after a certain amount of persuasion and just going back and forth and really like you know, showing motivation and optimism with the human resources, 
Um, I finally got an opportunity to do some marketing illustration work as a way to make, you know, to prove to them that, hey, you know, this is what I do for a living before you hired me, you know, here at Ubisoft. Like I worked in a publishing company, I studied in illustration and design. So I took a bit of convincing, right? Um, so that being said, like I'll show you some more examples of uh, pretty much some of the work that I did for uh, Rainbow Six Lockdown. You know, um, that's the actual, I guess, logo for the, the product. Um, I managed to do one character concept art piece, which is basically this dude right here and as well as this. Um, but then after that, I ended up working for about three, four months um, with an amazing marketing lead. Um, so I was his like handyman for creating marketing content artwork for the magazines like PC Gamer um, and um, I guess other publishings. So here's some examples of some of the artwork that I produced. Um, so yeah, I mean, unfortunately the way the industry works sometimes is that sometimes you gotta leave one place to make a name for yourself in another place. So that's when I ended up leaving to uh, Ubisoft after four and a half years. Um, I went over to a company uh, that is currently called Behavior. It was under a different name when I first got hired there. And uh, on that pro on that, at that company, that's when I got to work on some really cool projects that were super fun. Um, one of the games that we shipped was Rango. Um, it was published by EA. Um, it's a movie that was uh, done by um, an a first, like an only animation feature that was done by ILM Studios at the time. Um, and, you know, because, you know, then they're all about feature movies and stuff, but they never did a feature animation. And it was Johnny Depp who played the voice of the chameleon, the main character, Rango. So these were some of the scenes and shots that I had done in terms of key art. Um, so this was some prop designs that I had done. Uh, that ended up going into the game. Uh, that's uh, Rango's pistol. Um, and this is another project that I originally got hired on for until it went bust. Not really, it just got put on the shelf for X reasons. Um, and that's what led me to other projects like Rango. Um, but so this was like basically a horror game uh, where it was like a slasher game paying homage to, you know, the 1980s slasher movies like Halloween, Jason, Friday the 13th, where you actually play the, the killer, right? So it's a stealth game slash, you know, you got to take out your victims one by one. And I was basically hired because of my dark style um, in mood shots and stuff to help, you know, design uh, and even conceptualize key artwork for the, the environments. So here's a couple examples of that. Um, and yeah, another thing that I had the opportunity to do was to work on, on a couple of pitches over there. So a pitch is basically when you're working with uh, the creative director or your client within the company. And um, you know we're, we're pitching ideas to try to get funds for it, right? So it was a great opportunity because for like literally a whole year or so, I was working just one-on-one -on -one with the creative director and not really like in a production environment. So this was super fun. Um, again, this was like a very stylized kind of game that was kind of highly inspired by Team Fortress, uh, Team Fortress 2 actually. And uh, it was a game that kind of, uh, you know, you get it's like a kid's game on Wii, which was kind of like Ghostbusters, so to speak, but you're a firefighter and you're basically trying to battle like these fire demons. So here's a couple examples of, you know, um, little fire demon sprites that I designed. So the key thing with that was thinking about attitude, personality, and silhouette. Um, the same went with the characters. So there's a couple examples of that. Tell Oops. me something, Nick, when you're pitching ideas, you know, and developing these concepts, are you working off a brief? Are you, how much information do you actually have to start, you know, narrowing down these ideas and actually offering better, better creative oh, great. output. A oh, very good question. Um, I was a professional artist or in a studio environment, right? It's a team effort. So usually, yes, there's always like a certain type of brief. 
Um, let's say, for example, in this case, there's like a brief for designing these characters, right? So it's a conversation that you usually have with your client. In this particular case was the creative director, um, one of the creative directors at Behavior at the time. So, you know, he had this idea, he goes, yeah, I want to make like this kind of Ghostbusters uh, kind of game, but with firefighters and, you know, he's, you got to battle demons and you got to prevent them from take, you know, burning down homes. So it starts off with kind of like a conversation like that, but what's really cool uh, and organic is that, um, you know, there's only so much that the creative director can do. Like he has a very, very high level vision of what he wants and I'm there to help it flesh that flesh out all the details and maybe even provide um, other possibilities in terms of a design because sometimes what they think vision, like mentally or even you know, like written down on notes sounds good. But then when you put it down on paper, it doesn't really work, right? So it's always like a, a going back and forth and it's a really fun and organic process to basically be able to collaborate with someone who's got like a really cool idea and, you know, um, I'm hired or basically, you know, assigned the, the, the mandate or job to try to help him bring it to light. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it sure does. And when you're doing this, when you're developing and pitching ideas, are you working on like your journal? Your Is this on paper or... I know that these are really refined ideas you're showing us and these are, you know, with color and possibly all digital already. But when yes. you're doing this and brainstorming, are you just sketching in a sketchbook or are you already doing it in your iPad or your Cintiq or are you already doing it on digital? Um, it depends. Um, I mostly do digital sketches um, nowadays. Um, but back then, I still felt the need to draw on paper. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, art directors or, you know, clients, they don't really care what kind of medium you use as long as you get the idea out, right? You're able to generate the idea. So uh, it's a good thing you, you, you mentioned that because these are actually sketches that I had done on just basic letter, you know, photocopy paper, right? These are, um, these weren't pencil, but they were more, um, what are they called? Uh, it was a Tuscan red very thin pencil by by prismacolor um, so it's a kind of pencil that's used by animators because it doesn't it doesn't streak it doesn't smudge it holds a really nice point to it um, and you know i always love that whenever i get a chance to sit down and and draw on paper i just love the feeling of the texture you know it's like it's something that you can't replicate um, until basically wacom came out with their new uh their new product line because it's just it's got that that tooth and texture feeling when you're drawing, so which is really cool. So um, ever since I was introduced to a Cintiq, that's when I said, okay, I don't need paper anymore, right? It's more effective and efficient, and I'm able to draw, you know, directly onto a tablet or just a drawing board. Because um, one of the things I found drawing or working with an Intuos is a tablet. It's like you're staring up at the monitor, right? Um, and like you get used to it. Like I started off working digitally with just a tablet and it took a lot of getting used to, but then once you get the hang of it, right? Uh, you get by and you can get by really well. It's not to say that working on a Cintiq is gonna be a game changer. <clears throat> um, it's got its pros and cons. Like working on a Cintiq for me is amazing because if I'm actually doing line work, it's that eye hand coordination that I really enjoy about drawing traditionally uh, on paper. Right, whether you're working with a pen or a sketch pad and whatnot or pencil, um, it's that eye hand, eye hand coordination that when I'm doing line work, um, it's very precise. And the fact that I have editing power with working with layers and whatnot, you know, I don't feel so bad taking my time on a, on a sketch pad and like, oh no, you know, I rip out the page. You just always feel guilty. Well, me personally, I do that when I work. Uh, digitally, I don't have that guilt trip anymore. So I'm able to just like crank them out as much as I want. Oh, I don't like it. Create a new layer, erase it away. No problem. So, uh, so there's perks with working digitally and whatnot versus traditionally. Um, I, but I've never given up traditional media. Like I do it now on the side for myself for pleasure as a hobby. Whereas digitally I full on work, you know, I'm sh sorry, on a, 
production level, I work full on digitally now. Uh, there's just a lot more freedom, so to speak, and less constraints. Um, you can work super, super fast. You know, iterations of, you know, changes and stuff when the client wants something a bit different can be easily done, you know. Uh, so it's a lot more effective, so to speak. Right on. Earlier, I asked you um, in terms of software, uh, what your go-tos were, and you mentioned when you're working digitally, you like um, Photoshop. Yes. Is this uh, your go-to for, for sketching and, and why? It's not really made for sketching. Why, why do you like Photoshop for that? Um, you have a great point there. Um, recently, in terms of sketching and whatnot, I, I discovered Clip Studio Paint, um, which to me, for just doing line artwork and stuff, is I can't explain it. Um, it's a it's a program or software that's meant for people who want to do comic books and 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 mangas and whatnot. It's designed for people who draw. Not to say that you can't paint with it. Um, like I can still draw with Photoshop. There's no problem. But there's just something about the engine or the brush engine that for me in, in Clip Studio Paint it is so precise. Like, it's like, oh my God, why can't Photoshop do this, right? It's that feeling that you get um, when, when I, a perfectly good example is for anybody that's done inking uh, and uses, you know, dip pens or crow quill pens. When you're drawing and you press down, it's like it goes thick and thin and upon command, right? Like it all depends on the pressure of your hand and finger. How much you push down will allow as much ink to flow out. Flip Studio Paint, they killed it with that. Like Photoshop to me still hasn't, you know, been able to, to achieve that level of, I don't know how to explain it, but that level of um, sensitivity that you get with Clip Studio Paint. Um, that's a great so, point. I, I, I yeah. love that you're mentioning it because I love Clip Studio um, for, for painting, for drawing. Um, and I always ask this question uh, almost to anyone who uses pho Photoshop for painting. I always ask them, have you tried an alternative? Um, because Photoshop is great. It does many, many, many things and it does many things well, but um, you know, where it really shines is I believe photo editing uh, and photo ma ma manipulation. It's in the name. Uh, it's for photos. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm always curious, curious, like, you know, what other programs out there? Another thing is, um, you know, Adobe products are usually not really easy to get, especially for students. So um, people on a budget uh, could try other drawing um, apps well, to start getting good at drawing well, before they invest in something. Yeah, no, I can understand. I can understand. Um, so yeah, Clip Studio Paint as a, as a drawing you know, alternative painting software, um, by all means is, is like probably one of the best things to, to, you know, get. I mean, it's like for, if you don't get the pro version, it's like 50 bucks, 50, 60 bucks. If you get the pro version that has extra features, which has pretty much the same features, but a few, like maybe two or three extra things with like importing 3D and whatnot, um, there's no point. If you're just going to stick with like drawing, then just get the regular one. Um, there's another alternative too, which is even completely free, which is really good in a sense, um, is uh, a program called Krita, K-R-I-T-A. Um, I actually use it for fun. There's actually a couple of tools in there that I really enjoy using um, that um, like Clip Studio Paint doesn't have and, and Photoshop doesn't have. So like, I gotta say that I, I spoil myself Right. Um, I love experimenting. Like I was explaining to Patricio, I, I kind of like think of myself as a, uh, an alchemist, so to speak, where I like to try and test out new things. It's like, even when I was working traditionally, it's like, I like to experiment with techniques, mixed media materials, you know, um, and, and whatnot. So 
as a professional, I like to have that mentality as well, because when you're working in a production, you know, you're always trying to figure out new methods, new techniques, new production pipelines that ultimately, you know, will allow you to deliver and ship um, your work either at a faster level, either on a very detailed level, you know, like nowadays I'm, I'm, I'm not just 2D, I'm actually starting to integrate a lot of 3D into my workflow, right? Um, because there's certain things that you can generate and create in 3D that otherwise, you know, because of time constraints, so to speak, um, it's very tough to do, um, you know, on a, on a two dimensional level, right? Yeah. Um, so like I, I uh, expressed to a lot of people, you know, I've actually was an, an instructor for three years at a local uh, concept art school here in Montreal um, called Sin Studio. And I always like, I always get the same questions from students. Like, what is the best tool? What is the best tool? I'm like, listen, there's standard tools, but then there's tools that you can add to your tool belt. Like think of yourself as like a construction worker that has all these really cool tools and gadgets, right? And you know that after being proficient with one tool, and that's what I usually recommend is get really good at one tool and then start exploring other tools that can help you with things that that original tool cannot do, right? right so right. any kind of tool that can help you progress and deliver and, and, and create and design um, faster, like the speed is not the biggest thing. And what I mean by that is that you know, like, let's say, for example, if you have a week to produce X amount of work. Now, if you do it two dimensionally, like there's some people that can, they've just like, they've been doing it for years, you know, 20, 30 years, that's all that they've been doing. So they've got the expertise to crank out images, like in the full turnaround, like, let's say if you're doing a character design or a prop design, they can draw this in every angle because they probably have almost like an industrial design background, right? Right. Um, but, you know, for someone who's like really good at drawing, but okay, well, if I got to draw this in a different perspective or a different angle, well, you're kind of lacking if you can only crank out one or two when the other guy's cranking out 12, right? Mm -hmm. So introducing 3D in your workflow is, is a game changer for a lot of people because especially now that it's becoming a lot more easier, a lot more people have access to 3D, like Blender is free. Whereas before, you know, you were only limited to like 3D Studio Max, Maya. Um, SketchUp is actually another alternative for as a concept artist, which is like really cheap as well. Um, so there's a lot of options out there now where now you can actually integrate a 3D uh, workflow and design on a three-dimensional level. And what's great about that is that when you show that to the client, you know, they get to see a full 360 in the round, what their, let's say their prop object is going to look like. So it gives them a better idea. And usually you can like lock down a, um, like green light an assignment a lot more efficiently and faster when they're able to see, because most people like they're, they're visual people, right? But if you just throw them one sketch or drawing or two, and they're like, yeah, but what does it look like on the top? What does it look like on the back? Well, if you could do that in one shot in 3D, then, you know, there's there's yeah. a win situ a win win situation there. For sure. And you're right. There's so many more programs now than before. I love Blender. I just a few years ago, I began sculpting with clay and I've been really scared to go to digital because ZBrush scared me. But yeah, there's a lot of other programs that have simplified 3D. I'm so glad you mentioned them too. Um, these that you're showing, they're very, very uh, finished pieces. These look more, they're not just concepts. These are finished um, illustrations. Can you explain a little bit about how, you know, from concept to finished piece, how many iterations and how many people are actually involved? You're as a concept developer or artist, you're part of a pipeline. Yeah. Um, how many people are in this pipeline? Uh, it depends on the production. Um, like let's say for example, Rainbow Six Siege. Um, 
Ubisoft, for example, my from my experience working there um, in as a concept artist in production is is a little bit different than Warner Brothers, right? Uh, it depends on the mindset and mentality and the needs of what the client wants. Um, on these projects, for example, Rainbow Six Siege, uh, White Noise, that was the that was the uh, the level um, that was that in, in Korea was kind of like a, basically a tower, kind of like the CN Tower. Um, there was the, the tower in Seattle. Uh, there's one in Toronto. Yeah, uh, it's like a tower where basically that's where the gameplay is happening. Um, one of the core features about working with the production team, for example, on, on Rainbow Six is that level design is key, right? Um, level design comes first, concept art comes second. And what, that, what I mean by that is that the level designers, when they design, it's all like basic primitives, like boxes and cylinders and things that represent a wall or a bench or a counter. Um, and that is extremely important because um, it's a multiplayer game. It's a fast paced game, okay? So if game flow doesn't work in, in, in the level, then there's no point of trying to like concept everything out on a you know, on a concept art level because they go way too fast. So the way it worked on this particular project is they wanted someone to create key artwork, you know, kind of like set design, but mostly on the key art level. Um, and for example, in this particular case, each location had to have its own signature look because when you're playing the game and it's super fast action, right? Um, key landmarks are extremely important. So when you're playing with the team of like five buddies that are trying to take out the other team, you know, five, when you're running to these rooms, you're like, oh, oh, go to the upper atrium, upper atrium, you know, like they're able to locate, yeah. like for example, you know, key elements, visual like landmarks. So that way the game flow goes super fast. You know, like in this particular case, this was the biker gang. So it's like, oh, go through the hallway with a Harley in the window, you know? Um, so that was pretty much it. Like I had to work really fast with these. Like we had anywhere from sometimes a day to three days to crank these out. Um, sometimes half a day. Uh, depends on the complexity of you know the location. So usually, like I would go into the engine, or I, the you know the level designer that I'm working with um, would provide me a screenshot. You know, or I would sit with him and give me a screenshot of like the angle that I think would be optimal for me to illustrate on. Um, and in this particular case, it's like, it's, it's, there's a lot of photo bashing. There's a lot of painting. It's like, it's a mixed media of everything, right? Sometimes there's 3d that I create. Um, if like, let's say the actual geometric primitives are like really basic and I want to do something a little bit more complex, then I'll model it myself and integrate it into the scene. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was pretty much the workflow uh and and working on rainbow six um because that was the mentality they said there's no point we're not going to model exactly the location the way you're doing it because it, it's changing so much during production because a lot of the times what they do is that they would the level the designers would create a level that is physical and actually works and then they would send it out to testers that would test it right away and these testers would not look for bugs, but they're looking for gameplay advantages. They're like, okay, this wall sucks. And like, literally the guy created it about 20 minutes ago. Okay, this, this, this counter sucks. It doesn't work. Let's knock it out, like delete it. So it was very, very fast paced. Right. Uh, and tell me something, Nick, like, okay, you, you were designing like the, the places, the settings, and it's another mm -hmm. team uh, in charge of like the costumes and wardrobe and 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 gear uh, that display uh, or is one concept developer working on on all of it no there's uh not one concept artist working on it sometimes there are there are a bit, like rainbow six there was seven uh environment concept artists um and i think there was three or four um character concept artists that would basically focus on the gear um, and these guys were specialists. Like uh, there was one, a longtime industry friend of mine um, who's just like an encyclopedia for military stuff. Like the guy knew things inside out about weapons and costumes and 
tanks and vehicles. Like you ask him any question, he's like, he would probably outdo Google. Like that's how knowledgeable he was. Um, like he's a huge military buff. So they always find key people that can fit that profile. And he's like been on Rainbow Six forever. Um, so, and the environment team, like we're basically working with the, uh, with the art director and we're working together with him, right? Um, Cause sometimes the art director doesn't have the answers for everything because things are so fast paced. So we're allowed the ability to make proposals and before we actually start, let, let's say, for example, on a, this left piece right here, right, which is kind of like um, a secretary office, this is a, a VIP washroom. Um, I would sit down and create like literally a mood board with like interior design ingredients, aesthetics, like things that inspire me. So I would create a palette, a mood board palette with all these amazing like references that are cohesive that, okay, you know, there's things that can fit together. Um, let's say for example, for this scene. Um, and then I would present it to the art director because, hey, you know what? I really like that. It's got a different flavor than the other room. So let's roll with that and see what the team thinks. So I'm like, okay, cool. Then, you know, then I, I basically get to work, spend either, either from like anywhere from uh, a day to three days uh, putting it all together. You know, you, if I have to model, I'll model. If I have to photo bash, I photo bash. Um, I, if I paint, like literally all of this is a, a, a mishmash of different techniques and different softwares. So that's what I, I mean, going back to like tools, I can't really say there's one tool, right? Like the way I work is different from other people. Like I use whatever tool I think will help me deliver and ship um, as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible with a certain level of like, you know, quality that there's no second guessing when it's given to my clients, like my art director and even like the production team, you know, they see the elements that are like, oh, okay, I totally understand, man. Like, this is what I'll do. And, and they'll go and do their magic, right? Um, so here's some more examples. Yes. I'm curious because um, in gaming, obviously like the narrative you can set up the stage for the narrative, but the, you're not really working off a script. There's no actual story, or is there? Are you actually given a? You you, know, you don't have yeah the it depends on the game. Like for example, on on um, Gotham Knights, right? We have to really respect the Batman universe. Um, so the creative director and the writers on the project are literally consulting. Like they'll come up with their ideas and the, you know, like the reason why the game got signed on and green lit by Warner Brothers was because DC was on board and they liked the proposal of what they did. So now we got to respect that, right? So the narrative and storytelling of the game, it also evolves during production. Like they have a high level, um, a high level idea and you know, there's a script and whatnot. But then there's room and flexibility for things to change. I don't change that. It's actually that's that's you know information um, that gets provided to me at whatever point in time. Um, so usually, like the narrative, like let's say for example, this this particular scene is like okay, we want a a massive you know dump. Uh, what do you call it? Um, a junkyard, right? It's like in the future. You know, think Wally, -E, but cyberpunk, and you know, it, it becomes sometimes it comes down to like very vague ideas like that. But you kind of get a description based on the references that they're giving you, right? So that's the whole thing about world building is that there's no direct, you know, description. It's more like metaphorically using examples of examples that already exist, like movies that inspire, or maybe it was like from photography or from another game. They're like, hey, you know, like they did this. Let's see if we can give our own spin of that. Right. Um, so in terms on a, on a narrative level, like it, there's a high level vision to respect. There's a high level, um, I'll say kind of like a in preconception, for example, um, I showed up like two, I don't know how many years, it was probably me two years after the game got green lit, right? I've only been on, on the project for two years. So when I came on board, 
<clears throat> there was already like a good amount of examples that was set by the concept art team. And just, there's a kind of like a, a Bible that was created in terms of, you know, uh, setting standards. Uh, things to respect in terms of like color palettes, uh, textures, um, silhouettes, you know, uh, visual design cues that we have to respect that is part of the DC universe or what the production team has created and set the bar as, you know, it's kind of like a little visual Bible. So from there, you're like, okay, I get what you're doing. Like, I understand the flavor that you're going for. I know what kind of, you know, what visual language you're trying to communicate. And then I integrate that and I morph it into my work because I have to respect what, you know, what standards were created ahead of me by other artists. Um, but things change all the time, you know? As long as you respect the, the visual style, then you're, you're good to go. What kind, let's, uh, for those of interested in concept development, uh, what kind of artists make the best um, concept developers? What is a good combination of skills or interests that in your opinion um, make the best combination uh, of concept Fantastic, artists? fantastic question. Um, well, you can break it down into three categories of concept artist okay um you got the character designers you've got environment concept artists and now there's actually like concept artists that focus on industrial design right and what i mean by that is like let's say a guy who's just like really good at designing vehicles or spaceships or flying vehicles that's either in sci-fi or grounded in real world you know, there's specialists that focus on things like on subject matters like that. So the way I see it is that it's not a question of like, okay, which area of concept art, you know, I should focus on. It's what you like to do. You know what I mean? Um, what do you want to progress in? Is it something that you're naturally drawn to, like to, let's say, design really cool worlds like this, like environments? And that's your natural ability, you know, to sketch out ideas like that. There's other people that are just like really good at just doing anatomy or creature designs. Then you focus on that. You know what I mean? You could be a specialist that can just focus on that. Um, and throughout your journey and process in terms of learning, you can go to school, but to be honest with you, you know, it's good to go to school and get like some kind of certificate, but I'm not saying don't break a bank you know, with tuitions and whatnot, when nowadays there's so much online learning, it's incredible. You know, like I, even myself, after all these years, I still look and research like different methods and techniques from other artists that I highly respect. Um, we all know who they are, like Jamma Jerabev. He's, uh, he's a friend that I met several years ago when he did a workshop at the school that I, um, I taught at. And he was the one that convinced me to get a VR set which for example, thanks to him, I did a pitch for a project like using VR as one of my tools, right? This was a creature that I designed like literally and I did it live in Oculus Medium within like two hours. Um, and that's not like, okay, two hours of opening up the box and doing it. I actually had purchased a set for myself. Um, when I had to upgrade to a new PC, I specifically upgraded after, you know, meeting JAMA and said, okay, you know, I'm due for a new machine. Am I going to like VR? Then I must get a machine that is VR ready. And I fell in love with it. I'm like, I practiced for about maybe, I don't know, about a month or two getting a, get a, uh, you know, getting a certain feel of the tools and a workflow. And man, it is so intuitive. It's amazing. You know, um, it's not really meant for final product, but for a, a concept artist, it's amazing, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, after practicing for about a, like several weeks, maybe a month or two, I felt comfortable enough when the opportunity arose to like, you know, do a pitch for a massive creature design. Um, yeah, this was for a, a game that um, a really high level creative director at, at 
or game designer, sorry, at Ubisoft was trying to put together a pitch for six months and he managed to get the budget. So I was in between projects and, you know, I approached them about it and I say, Hey, you know what? Uh, you mind if I can give this a shot? He goes, yeah. So he briefed me. He goes, let me put you to the test. You know, like he gave me a brief, a verbal description of this monster. And that was like, let's say at nine o'clock in the morning, he gave me that brief. We were sitting down casually over coffee. I go back to my desk, literally by two, three o'clock in the afternoon, after chatting with him for about an hour or so, I provided him this. And the guy was just like, he's so used to getting sketches that he, he didn't believe that I did it. I'm like, dude, I provided it to him and he's just like, whoa, we just chatted this morning, like two, three hours ago. I'm like, yeah. He goes, you, you, you modeled this? I'm like, no, 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 I didn't model it. I sculpted it, you know, like in VR. And he was just like, my God. He goes, yeah, you're hired. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Sometimes experimenting with different tools will get you hired. Exactly. So don't limit yourself. Like, like for example, this is Photoshop. This is when I used to commute by train before we all, you know, worked from home remotely of COVID and stuff. Um, sometimes I'd be sitting down and rather than just sitting there staring out the window, I'll be sketching on the commute train for about an hour. And this is where I came up with a lot of these thumbnails for vegetation um, in, in the, um, the pitch I was doing. Uh, this was actually waiting at uh, my car mechanic, right? Uh, was waiting for him to rust proof the bottom of my car because unfortunately here in the East Coast, we got to rust proof our cars. They throw salt on the road to thaw out the ice. So while, you know, I was waiting for about an hour or so, I took out my, um, my India ink um, watercolor brush that I have that I basically, you know, uh, diluted some Indian ink, mixed it in, and then the rest was just with basically a Sharpie pen or some kind of pen that I have. Um, and it would just sketch and pass the time, you know, like these little thumbnails of silhouettes of different building structures I probably spent like maybe five, 10 minutes each, not going into detail, but just focusing on shape language, you know, a silhouette and trying to come up with different variations of architectural structures and huts for this project. Um, here again, here's this another example. And this is the software I was telling you about called Krita. I'm pretty sure some people know about it, but there's a really cool um, tool in there. I can't explain what it is, but it's it, the way it works is it's sculptural, but painterly at the same time. Um, and it, it gives it a really interesting look. Uh, so that's what I sketched with that, right? And again, another one here in pen and ink. Um, this was strictly in Photoshop with kind of like this inking technique that I have. Um, again, this is traditional pen and ink on paper, Photoshop. This is all for the same pitch. Wow. This is a mix of... Uh, That's an outstanding of, piece. This is uh, Photoshop, but a bit of uh, Oculus Medium 3D and a bit of photo bashing. Um, and like me personally, when I'm when I'm trying to do pitch ideas, I try to. I don't like to spend more more than a week. Like three days for me is already a lot, right? Um, simply because I like to keep the idea fresh. And if I'm basically stuck and stagnant, like I'd rather work on ideas like this that are a little bit more looser, um, even just black and white, uh, because I can really focus on the idea. Because if I drag it on too long with too much like detail and technique, it's like the idea just gets too diluted and too technical. Whereas if you keep it loose and dynamic, it just, it feels alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so that's pretty much. Thank you for sharing. I, I've i worked with um, a few concept developers and concept artists in the past, and I'm always fascinated. This side of uh, this part of the pipeline is so important and it gets overlooked so, so much. It's such an important part of the storytelling process. Without a strong concept, there's nothing. So thank yeah. you so much for giving us a, a very nice a uh, glimpse into concept developing in every step, uh, especially trying to build stories. I know it's a very, very vast subject that you're never gonna get to cover in one hour or in one of these talks, 
but um, I've done many of them, many of these talks. My, one of my favorite concept developers is Anthony Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. he, he, he's a very passionate a person about raising awareness about uh, concept development because a lot of students, a lot of young um, artists, amateur artists may be looking into where in, where in the arts they fit and a combination of their skills Everything that you mentioned to today is almost like a concept artist has to have a good amalgamation of skills and also flex flexibility with the mediums because it's not just about not knowing how to draw, but um, how to play with your tool set uh, to make a more impactful product. Um, working smarter, not harder. I like how you mentioned that your tools have helped you. We didn't get to cover how you customize your Photoshop um, for quicker um, uh, sure. workflow, but I'll invite you back so that we can have an actual working session uh, to see how you can quickly start sketching on Photoshop for concept developing, what exactly you do with your with your tools, your shortcuts for quick sketching. Because when you're brainstorming, you don't have time to really like play with brushes or anything. You're just going to go straight to sketching. And I want to see how you set, set up your, your Photoshop canvas um, for success. But Absolutely. is there anything you um, want to add? We are at one hour. You can show us quickly a little bit about how you uh, customize your Photoshop canvas. Or if you think it's going to take too long, we can bring you back for a second session and solely focus on customizing your canvas for quick brainstorming. Absolutely. Um, well, depending on how things go in the next hour, um, I kind of wanted to break it down into my foundation for setting up a shot and my thought process behind it. Um, and then there's also breaking the, the demo with, you know, setting up your tools to be as efficient as possible just within Photoshop. Um, you know, there's been a lot of trial and error and like, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that, that I'm always fidgeting around to make it as, as efficient as, as, as possible for me. Um, like you can make, you can be as very, like as keep it as simple as possible with just using one pixel brush, no problem. Right. Um, and just draw with that. Uh, and I know a lot of people that do. You know, they just, they stick with the standard default, you know, round brushes, hard edge and, and, you know, soft airbrush. Um, but like I said, for me, there's uh, I like to, I'm like a kid in a, in a sandbox. I like to play with the different toys and just create new things. It's like, for me, it's part of the fun, right? It's like the, the, the creativity part is not with just, um, coming up with ideas and drawing and executing, but also coming up with fun tools. You know what I mean? Um, because when I started drawing and painting as like from a child, I was always very intrigued with different materials, you know, the sensation of things. Like how can I portray that and, and bring that onto a digital canvas, you know? Um, so yeah, if you'd like me to move forward, I could just show you kind of just, my thought process, um, I can yeah, share with you my it. screen. And uh, let's see where we share. Ooh, I almost hit the leave button. Not good. <laughs> let's see. Careful. Okay. I, know. <laughs> I work with two different, uh, what do you call it? Um, there's there's Skype and then you now you have uh, Zoom and then you've got other software that I use at work for that. So, all right, let me go back to my little PDF just to kind of give you my breakdown of what I'm going to do. Um, okay, so um, foundation and thought process. Uh, so my thoughts in terms of how I approach creating a scene is separate from technique, okay? Um, I don't like to think about Photoshop or anything. This is strictly stuff that I'm pretty sure that a lot of people have seen in other tutorials. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's the fundamentals of co composing a shot, okay? So 
composition. You know, um, a lot of things that over time become recipe in my brain, in my mind, it's become habit because I've done it so many times. But if I were to break it down, my composition thought is it's about simplifying your planes um, for ease of re re readability. And what that means is basically being able to break down your image from foreground, middle ground, and background, okay, um, in threes. I think of it, I follow basically the rule of thirds. So I break things into thirds, not in odd numbers. I mean, in odd, not in, 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 sorry, even numbers, but in odd numbers, okay? Um, so I break it down into three grounds, the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. What I mean by that is exactly in this composition, this example right here, right? Um, if you can make those three planes read well, it's not like, okay, you know, in cinematography, you, you, you got a camera and, and, and you know, with, with a very hyper-realistic lens and whatnot, but it's more about graphically. Like I, I, my rendering style is slightly realistic or very realistic, depending on which, which you know, subject matter I'm working on. But as long as I can make those three grounds, ground planes work and read well on a graphic level, the audience is gonna see that and read it well, okay? Um, you see that a lot in animation, you see that a lot in feature movies, like after doing post-processing, you know, like when they actually do a live shot and then they bring it back to the post-processing studios and they basically start working on their magic, they start breaking down the images with high contrast in the foreground, you know, lightening up in post-process, like the middle ground to draw the viewer's attention. It's a subliminal art form that, you know, an artist needs to understand that it's subtle and will basically guide the viewer's eye to what is important within the scene. So another thing that I like to do too is it's combining it with using leading lines. That's how I set up my composition, right? I use leading lines to kind of guide the viewer into the direction of what is important within the scene, okay? Using light contrast, communicate depth within the scene and break up the planes, okay? In my demonstration, you'll understand what I'm talking about with this, but basically, you know, you could create a composition with just line work to break up elements like this, you take it to the next level by shading. You can achieve the same amount of compositional narrative storytelling uh, with either line, line art or just painting it on with a lot of values and whatnot. So values and contrast. Um, lighting in combination with leading lines can also help direct the viewer's eye to a focal point. In this particular case, my focal point is this opening between this barge that, you know, this tanker that crashed onto a beach. That could be in a game, right? Where, you know, you're driving your cruiser and you got to get through this, maybe this is a gate to safety or something. So how do we, you know, illustrate that in a, in a, in a very fun um, and narrative way? It's through composition. And basically it's, it's kind of like taking the viewer and, subconsciously holding them by the hand like a child and, and guiding them to that opening, which I call the focal point. Um, and you can also do that basically with a lot of values. Like for example, in this particular scene, I use a lot of dark values in the foreground. The middle ground is dark, but then the light, the background is lit, you know, it's pretty bright. But then right here down the center, that's my brightest point. It's done very like in a balanced way and subtle and done in a graphical way at the same time that, you know, I, I that's just my artistic intuition there. This is the way I like to work. Um, and, and I like to basically guide the viewer in that particular direction of importance within a scene. Okay, so the rule of thirds is a grid that I use always. 
it also applies to weight and balance within a team. So 70%, which you see in silhouette right here, right, is the weight. It's, it, that's the kind of like the gateway in the shot, which is this big barge on a beach, okay? Um, so that has to carry a lot of weight. So the, I won't say it's exactly a 70-30 split, but I kind of like to aim for that, that weight and balance. Now, the rule of third grids, you'll see that in a, in, in, in a lot of cinematography, right? A lot of movie, uh, movie directors and cinematographers, like when they're like looking through their screen, they'll actually have this kind of grid set up and it's for a good reason. Um, I used to have a DSLR camera, but now because of like the high tech cell phones, you know, um, they're so good that I don't need to bring a cam big camera with me anymore just to take some shots because I actually use my cell phone now. And in the options, I actually turn on this grid. It's always on when I'm, when I'm you know, basically shooting reference or just taking pictures of family and friends. I use that grid to compose my shot. So as you can see right here, the rule of thirds grid, there's four points. These points are very important within composition, okay? It's basically kind of like directing the viewer's eye to the focal points. So in this particular case, you can kind of see that this vertical line is the opening and it has equal importance with these two dots, you know, generating the focal point um, that I want the viewer to look at. Now, in terms of the weight, it's occupying like a huge portion on this side right here, which basically brings me down to this, the 70-30 split. Right. So it's not to say that 70% is more important. It's just that's the way I compose it. I decided that 70% is going to be the important part. Sometimes it could be 30%. It all depends on your composition. So it's up to you as the artist to decide and direct the viewer with what is the most important thing within a scene. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that being said, if there's anybody that has any questions regarding this, um, be my pleasure to answer them. Um, if not, we can go dive in directly into Photoshop and uh, can kind of give you a little demo. Let's go for it. Thank you for showing us the rule of thirds. My pleasure. All right, let's see where we get Photoshop here. There we go. All set up. Okay, so before going into tools and whatnot, we'll just talk about, we'll sketch here and have some fun. All right. Do you um, have, do you, are you using just a tool set that Photoshop came with or did you build your own brushes? That um, I have a whole bunch of custom brushes, but for this particular case, this is a standard hard brush that is, you know, it's part of the uh, the choices of default brushes in Photoshop. So first things first, this is my brush set. Um, this is my later stack. Uh, please ignore these two things here. These are actually add-ons that I purchased myself, but you know, Photoshop has its own color wheel. Not to say that it's bad, but this has something special that I really like using. Um, so, if we're gonna go and talk about setting up a composition, okay. Um, there we go, that works. Oh my goodness, that resolution is very low. Sorry, let me just increase the resolution on this. And pixels, that's very small and very fuzzy. There we go. Now the resolution is higher. Apologies for that. There we go. See how my lines are nice and crisp? Okay. So first things first, you create a new layer. Um, 
you can either be very, very picky and just create a rectangle, whether it's like landscape mode or portrait mode, it's up to you. Um, so let's see. Let's pretend it's paper, All right? So the rule of thirds, one of the things I like to do is I divide my canvas with these imaginary, this imaginary grid line, right? Let's say if I were to draw these down, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it kind of like gives you an idea of how you can compose your scene. And so it's not too, too distracting. You can either reduce the opacity or you can do like little tick marks on the side of the frame like I did. And just for the sake of the exercise or little demo, we'll put it very light. And these right here are our important points. Okay. Um, now, I don't always put this kind of grid because I see it in my head when I'm actually working. But just for the sake of the demo, I'm just going to create a few thumbnails here very fast to kind of like illustrate how we can set up a shot, how we can drive the viewer's eye to the location that we want, or the object of importance. Um, which is the focal point, right? So these are the key words that we're looking at. That's my frame. So I'm gonna group this, so keep it uh, organized. I'll add another layer in that group. All right, so here we go. Okay, so let's say for example, in this scene, I want to have a Let's say a character uh, that's either driving a vehicle or or just a creature, whether it could be riding a horse or a camel or a fantasy creature across some kind of desert vista approaching some kind of, I don't know, some kind of mountain region with a structure that is important. Okay. At this phase of the game, like this is something that I do for myself. Um, whether I'm in production or even for myself personally, um, this is a thumbnail that I like to work and create just for myself, right? This can take anywhere from a minute to five minutes to create, all right? So nobody's uh, chasing you. Nobody's like putting a gun to your head. So hey, you got to deliver this thumbnail because like really a lot of people don't really care about thumbnails. Um, they want to see more like a very, you know, half pushed result of an image or, or even finished. <laughs> so let's see. So let's say I want my character to be here. Now you got to decide, do I want him very fast, very sketchy? How close do you want him to the camera? This, these are like factors that you got to decide. Okay, do we want him that close? Do we want him a little bit further away? Say so he's riding some kind of creature, the saddle, and I'm keeping it very loose. I'm not looking at the details. I'm not looking at anything. Just making sure that it feels good within the scene. So you notice the point that I was talking about? Well, I'll take this dude and put him right here, All right? And then I'll create a new layer and say, okay, well, I, I've already drawn him looking in this direction. Now let's draw the scenery with leading lines guiding you as a, as a viewer to that direction. Like I'm deciding, okay, I got my, my character here. I want him to look. Where do I want him to look at this point? Do I want him to look at this point or do I want him to look at this point? Okay. So here's the leading lines. And remember that 70, 30, like visual weight that we we're talking about. Well, this is what we're going to try to achieve right now. So there's that kind of weird structure. Now I want to use leading lines. Erase that. Don't know what exactly that is yet. 
Now we want to use leading lines to guide the viewer eye. So right now we kind of have this point, this hint of him looking that way or walking in that direction. But we can go an extra step further by saying, okay, let's use natural elements in nature to kind of like lead us that way too. So let's go with, let's say a, cl a cloud line, the base of a cloud line, right? That is kind of leading your, your, the viewer's eye there, All right? We can also use path that he's walking on, right? So right there, I was able to achieve leading lines, energy lines, flow lines. And let me just change the color so people can see it. That would work best. Let's go over to red. Hello. All right, so can you, Nick, recommend uh, perhaps either a YouTube channel or um, maybe a Twitch stream of someone offering super basic um, tips like this on how to start, you know, like these rules, um, very basic rules, or is there a book that you recommend that covers these basics, um, how to drive the eye, how, how to come in and out of the frame, how to- really Yes, of course. Um, in terms of online, uh, there are a couple of artists that come to mind. There's Sparth or Nicolas Bouvier. Um, then there's uh, John J. Park. He's a fantastic artist that, you know, just produces some amazing like sceneries um, and like environment concept artwork that is very fastly done. It's loose and very painterly. Uh, he's got a couple of videos or even like on Instagram or a social media feed uh, where he's been interviewed and he talks about that kind of process, right? Um, like including myself, this is the kind of stuff that people that work in the field, we all know about, right? Because we're all interacting with one another, so to speak. And this is the kind of like workflow that we all use. Um, but it's not really a workflow. It's a more about, this is the fundamentals of being able to compose a shot, um, creating a really nice composition to draw the viewer's eye. Like I was, you know, kind of like reiterating what I said earlier. Um, they talk about it in their own manner as well, right? But it all comes down to the same thing. It all comes down to the same thing. So uh, a really good book or to look into is, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, Scott Robertson's um, uh, Design Studio Press. Design Studio Press. So this is Scott Robertson's uh, publishing company. Um, he is a known concept artist and also instructor at uh, the famous school in California. Um, he's an amazing industrial designer. And Framed Inc. by Matthias, um, what's his name again? Mat Mat oh, Marcos Matemetre. Oh my goodness. Is he Spanish or is he French? I think that's um, French. Yes, you are correct. So he's got, um, I, I think, three books or maybe two. Uh, but his first one, I mean, all of them are really good. And this guy is a comic book artist. He's a storyboard artist. Um, and there's no better the like better instructors to talk about this kind of subject matter than actual storyboard artists or graphic novel artists that that that's their whole story, you know, like each frame tells a story and how it's got to interlink with one another, right? But even just like as a single frame in a comic book or in a storyboard, it's like, picture me right now, just creating one of those frames, right? It's got to work. But imagine trying to do a sequence of these frames, 
right? For let's say storyboarding, so to speak. Um, like even comic book artists, it's, it's, it's a form of storyboarding itself because when you're trying to tell the narrative and the sequence of what they wanna you know, communicate across um, in the story, they gotta do that sequentially with each frame, right? Um, so I'm basically compressing basically what they do, but in one single frame for one big, like, you know, key art piece that is like a, a, a really well rendered illustration, you know, that's kind of like a money shot, something mm -hmm. that production can like look at and say, okay, this is what we're aiming for right here, right? This is like one part of the visual Bible, so to speak, because um, that's literally what key artwork uh, stands for. Awesome. It's like setting the bar high for, okay, this is the goal that we want to attain. It's not to say that it's exactly that, but we're aiming for that, right? So when you're creating key art, it's, it's extremely important to understand these, found, uh, these fundamentals of like, um, you know, composition, um, using leading lines to direct the viewer's eye to the focal point, right? Uh, of, of you know what the storyline is all about. Like I just basically made that up right now, a horseback rider or like they could, this could be a sci-fi scene. This could be like a medieval scene. Um, this could be a contemporary scene. Like maybe the guy is driving a beetle or an ostrich, an ostrich, <laughs> that'd be funny. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? So the next step right here, for example, is like, okay, now we have these lines. How can we take it the next, uh, another step further? And that's where we can work with value, right? Contrast and value of breaking up the, the foreground, middle ground, and background elements, okay? So as you notice here, I got these uh, gray tone swatches. I put them there for a reason. Um, and I could just easily come in and color pick. So I usually like to start off with the medium tone and on a separate layer, oops, sorry about that. So now all these layers right here is line work. If I'm content with it, then I can just like merge them or crush them. The one thing I will not merge is the character. I like to kind of keep those things kind of, even though it's in a sketch phase, I like to keep it optionally separate. Um, that. So now I've merged my background drawing and I kept this guy separate. So let's put him on top. The reason why I do that is because like, okay, well maybe I can create another composition and I'll show you that right now. I could duplicate these two and just hide these and kind of say, oh, if I'm not totally sure about this composition, well, let's see if we can just with the sketch, not spending too much time. Oops, sorry. Uh, without the frame, of course. There. So let's see if we can make it even more interesting and dynamic, right? And so by pressing Control T, you can activate the free transform tool uh, so long as you're selected on the layer. Um, what's really cool about the free transform tool is that you can really fast, you know, in a very fast manner, change the dynamics of this, this, uh, this element. Um, you can also right click on it and use warp. Warp is like, more curvy, whereas the other one is more angular, right? So if I go back to free transform, by holding down control, you can move around just the points. Or let's say, for example, I'll undo that. If I hold control, alt, and shift, it's like, oh, I want to change. Oops. Oh, sorry about that. Why isn't it working? Hello. right there. Okay. So yeah, if I hold control shift and alt and grab one of the corners, I'm actually like, you notice that this is a rectangular plane. So imagine you're doing something that's a hard surface, like a side of a building or a texture you want to lay. You can actually add more perspective to it. Let's say I want this guy to be really far out into the distance. It's a bit exaggerating. It's not the greatest, but I kind of like what we were going with and let's go with this and a bit of work. So right away, I'm kind of 
you know, I find this is kind of interesting as well, where I've add, added more fluid lines to the scene rather than if we looked at the original one, we merged that together. Do that. Oops. Reveal them. Okay, so, so this is the before. And then after my modifications, after. All right. So I find this kind of interesting, right? But let's say, oh, you know what? Let's take it a step further. Let's say with this shot right here, let's change this guy and make him a little bit more in the foreground, right? Again, sticking within the rule of thirds at that point that's down here. See what I mean? Um, so in this particular composition, rule of thirds, well, look, you've got this hill that is like 70% of the image going back to that 70-30 split. And the 30% is going to be the mass that's in the distance of this structure, cliff, whatever it is. Okay. So the next step would be, okay, let's test out, um, add a new layer. But this time I'm gonna put this layer in multiply mode. And multiply, what that does is that it makes it transparent. So multiply is kind of like um, adding a, a tint, a transparent tinted glass over your line drawing. Kind of like, you know, cathedrals and their tinted windows. Um, and screen is like adding white but it's also transparent, so to speak. Sorry, it's opaque. Um, all right, so let's go with that. So I'll start off with the mid-tone, which is this, fill it up. Okay, so that's on top. Now in the distance, actually, sorry, let me uh, show you another more effective way. Rather than doing it on that layer, I turned it back to normal for right here. I'm going to group that. And I'm going to put this folder in multiply mode, but keep the actual image layer as normal. Okay, to normal. And then put that to multiply. So in doing so, I can add a layer. Put that as the medium one, put it in the background. And then I can start just with my lasso. I'll take this lighter tone, add that there. And then I can use these objects or values as a clipping mask. So a clipping mask is when you add a, a new layer and by holding Alt and you go in between the layers, you're linking it to this one. So this empty layer here is using this as a mask, okay? It's a, it's a very non-destructive way of working, which is going back to um, the main subject matter of working efficiently, working smart, so that way you don't always have to redo things, right? If you actually organize it in a way keep things simple, uh, you can always go back and edit very easily. Okay, so let's go with that. Um, lay on top of this so I can get this horsey dude. Almost looks like a big sheepdog. Oh, sorry. I thought I was using the lasso tool. It's definitely an apocalyptic horse. <laughs> it could be whatever. <laughs> I mean, after seeing the movie Dune, actually, there wasn't any, aside from the worm, there wasn't really any other crazy creatures. Um, okay, so I went during uh, the beginning of the lecture when I was talking about making sure that things read from you know, foreground, middle ground, and background. So they said the foreground is the, the character right here. The middle ground is like the ground that he's standing on. And that's the background, which is that structure 
in the distance. Okay. Um, oops. So let me just put a mask on this to kind of keep it all clean. And I'm doing it on the actual folder. So a little trick actually that I like to, to use is, you know, we all have a tendency of wanting to draw very close, but it makes no sense when you're drawing this close on something digital, right? I mean, not, let me rephrase that. Zooming in makes it a lot easier to actually add those kind of details, right, on a thumbnail. But it can be very fooling because you can kind of get lost with details on something that's not supposed to be very detailed. Sometimes I zoom in this, this close because it's a lot easier ergonomically on my fingers and, and my wrist, right, that I like to draw with my elbow. Um, so what I like to do is little trick is you take your file, make sure that your, your file is selected right here, the window. And if you go under windows, under arrange, I'm creating a duplicate. It's more like a mirrored version of this, which you can draw on as well. Okay. So one of the things I like to do is I like to see my image, right? Let's say if I'm working something very detailed, I like to look at it at a distance. So that way I can focus more on composition than actual detailed, you know, line drawings or, or textures, right? So it's a little handy way of like, like I will be drawing on this window, but I'm really looking at the little thumbnail in the distance. So that way I don't get lost and carried away with adding too much detail within my thumbnail or my sketch. Okay. So now that you kind of get the gist of how I like to sketch out, let's you kind of get an idea. Let's go and create another one very fast. Let's go put this up here. So you're going to get to see, you know, how I usually like to work at real time, real speed. Um, so let's say I'm going to go with another say, portrait. Okay. Um, tick, tick, tick. If you don't mind, I like to talk when I kind of mumble to myself when I'm drawing. <laughs> I was going to ask you, is there a specific sort of like mood that you like? Do you listen to um, any sort of like if you're doing a game, for instance, do you listen to the soundtrack of the game or the music to put you in the mood and sort of bring those that imagery as you're creating? It depends. I, I a lot of the time, like I got a um, what do you call it? Bluetooth earphones um, with, with noise cancellation. Um, so if I need to focus on something, like I'm really focusing a lot, I actually just turn on the noise cancellation and just total silence. But, right, like for example, in, in this particular phase when I'm kind of sketching and I'm brainstorming, I usually like to work silently. But then when I get into the whole cruise control of, oh, okay, now I'm painting, I've, I've established my composition. It's like everything is problem solved. I just have to paint it. Then I'll either put on some background music or background YouTube video of sorts, um, or even, um, you know, uh, put something on Netflix, you know, just some kind of background noise um, or music. Like I love hip hop, I love punk rock. I love lots of music, but I mean, those are primarily the kind of tunes I like to listen to. Um, and just go to the groove, you know? Um, so if I'm doing something that's very energetic and stuff, I really go with something that is like punk rock is pretty fast or even just heavy metal. <laughs> um, and just have fun with it, you know? Cause I mean, music and, and, and drawing is very rhythmic, right? It, it goes together. So depending on the kind of mood I'm in, I will play music or watch something with, a, let's say a movie with a soundtrack or something in the background. Sometimes I'll just play a movie just to hear people talking or even just like the music in the background.
That's great. I always ask artists these questions to it, and I always like to hear the different answers. Some people just despise noise. They like to work, like you say, with some noise canceling headphones, some noise machine, because you know <laughs> it's like they have to concentrate. And other people enjoy music or podcasts. I I think I'm a hybrid. I like both. Sometimes I have to really, really concentrate. I hear you. I mean, like when it also depends on your mood, right? You're like in the morning, um, I'm half awake. I can't think <laughs> until I digested my coffee and things start to kick in. So at that point, I'm kind of like nice and quiet or the opposite. If I really need to wake up, then I'll put on some lively music, either my Bluetooth set or, or the speakers in my room, um, wrestle with my dog just to kind of get the blood flowing, you know, um, Format my cat by sending my dog to chase after her. So whatever gets. Gets the rhythm going, gets the energy going, you're just keeping it fun. Okay. So as you can kind of see that, right, by keeping things simple and keeping those. Um, those compositional, you know, key elements in mind. See, if you notice, I didn't put any ticks, right? If I were to go and put those little ticks on top, I'm subconsciously just like creating that rule of third right there, right? So look, I have this dude right here that's important. I know that that's going to be a focal point in this particular case, right? I've got this character right here that is the focal point. Not only that, I was kind of thinking, oh, it'd be kind of cool if he was backlit, right? With creating a focal point and, a, and, and kind of like showing the importance of this character, right? Coming into the scene, so to speak. Um, I'm planning in my head to like kind of light it up with like, maybe it's he's coming into a cave or a door entrance or a gate. So he's going to be lit up. So he's going to have kind of like this halo effect, right? So this is where all those those elements that I was um, explaining in the beginning will come into play when I'm thinking about this all at the same time. OK, um, so now if I go really fast and just. Add some, let's say, color to or just values to it to kind of bring things out with the intention that I'm kind of aiming for. Let's go. Multiply mode. Okay, so I'll start off with just all of them gray. I'll turn off those grids. Um, let's see what's going on. And then by adding a clipping mask, I don't have to worry about painting past the board line. Okay, and again, it's very simple hard edge brush, right? Let's say uh, I want to create kind of like a spill of light, kind of like a corridor. And then I can use um, the gradient tool to kind of make it feel like, oh, he's coming in from the outside. And then over this particular area right here, straight black and just with the gradient tool create kind of like this cast shadow and just keeping it simple it doesn't have to be complex so now when i zoom out actually I'm zoomed in but um i should be looking at my little thumbnail here right i'm not paying attention to details but i can clearly see what's going on within the right. thumbnail if everything reads well, okay? So let's say for example, with this shot right here, um, hide it. in this particular case, we're gonna use lighting to direct the viewer's eye and also in combination with the kind of flowy, the flowy um, leading lines that are created on the ground, we're gonna use light 
We've all seen this in games. We've all seen this in illustrations or, or concept artwork where they'll use a god ray, you know, to kind of direct the viewer towards the location or the focal point. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, boom, boom. Okay, so god ray. It's like, oh, the heavens are telling me to go in this particular particular direction as the, the cavalier rides in that in that way. Yeah, that can sound kind of cheesy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Look at that. I love it. I love that, you know, you're showing us how storytelling, it's not just the action or what's happening, but what's going on in the background, even the light is saying a story, it's telling you what time of day it is, where this person is going, uh, how fast they're going, depending on how quickly that light goes. So just with light, you get to tell some, so many details in the narrative. I like that. Exactly. Let's put him in the shadow. Like he could be writing. I don't know. He's he's okay. Let's let's tell the story. He he just entered here, and then maybe there's kind of like this pinhole in the cave that's shining like this god ray, and he's got to go find the holy grail or the treasure or maybe the damsel in distress that is I don't know in a coffin or something. So I mean, if we zoom out, like we kind of get already a glimpse of what's going on. We like okay, this naturally we're thinking that's important. Like we see that a lot in movies. We see that a lot in animation. Like, um, and, and, and what's really cool about in games is that it's interactive, right? But you could still have those kind of like narrative um, beats, so to speak, within an environment, right? So, you know, you're following the storyline, let's say if you're playing Assassin's Creed or Gods of War um, or even Halo, Right. You can hear like there's a narrative, hey, you got to go to this place and pick up this code or this treasure box or, you know, go save this person or investigate that area or zone of the, the map. And these are little things that that um, the lighting artist in game will actually um, either create themselves or inspire from specifically the concept artwork uh, and use that as a form of direction. Right. So a lot happens just with like these little thumbnails. And then, you know, when I present sometimes this to my client and stuff, they're like, oh, okay, I know what you're going for. I just literally, if I wasn't talking right now, I would have cranked this out in like maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, right? Doesn't take much to explain, right? To your client, what they were expecting. Like they'll give me a brief and say, we want the guy running off Let's say, for example, here, riding off to his destination out in the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden he sees this structure, right? Well, I could show him that, like this little thumbnail, and he'll go, okay, I get it. Okay, now let's take it to the next level and start polishing it up, adding more details. So I like to basically take my client through um, different stage gates, right? Because it's a, kind of like a way of, it's a process of elimination where rather than just giving him one finished image and then say, uh, the intent is there, but that's not the composition I was looking for. You know what I mean? I wasn't, I didn't visualize it like that. Well, if you don't provide the client, the, the, the different possibilities, right? Like for example, for this single shot, sometimes I could do two, three, four, five, up to 12, 15 little thumbnails until clear enough for the client to look at and say, oh, I, I like that one. Let's go with that. Let's roll with that, right? It can be one, two, three little thumbnails and it costs nothing to do, right? It's, it's, it's not valuable time that's, that's lost in your day. Um, it's not money that's lost for the client. So when you take them through these different iterations and, and stage gates and pipelines, so to speak, um, it's like, it's more room for success and it's more room of actually narrowing down you know the best result possible for let's say particularly um this particular frame right here right so let's say i'm doing like this right here is like a sequence of the actions that are happening so let's say for example if i'm doing one concept art key art for this i could sometimes do like anywhere from i'll nail it sometimes with one 
maybe two, three, four. Um, I also have to keep in mind and know and understand what the client wants. You know, as a professional and working this many years, I can kind of get a feel of what they want because like they communicate it a certain way, but I can kind of read into their emotions, right? Um, and I usually have a tendency of being able to deliver, you know, fairly close to what they're looking for, right? I mean, it's not only about having um, the ability to sketch this out, but it's also really trying to cater to the, the needs of the client. Uh, so it's a lot faster and more effective to, you know, focus on look, basically, yeah, what's going on? There we go. Uh, you know, to focus on these little fast sketches and, and, and thumbnails and figuring out the composition and the narrative intentions behind it and the story. And then once you're like, okay, everybody is, is on board, they like this, then you start taking it to the next level where you can start polishing it a bit more. You can start refining, uh, refining um, you know, the, the anatomy of the character, the, 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 the stage and scene or area that the uh, character and story is taking place in. Like, is it a desert? Is it a closet? Is it like an abandoned mine shaft? Um, so I kept this kind of vague, like, but all of these thumbnails can work with any kind of subject matter or genre. You know, this could be Final Fantasy, like the guy finds an ostrich or a, an ostrich llama and takes it across the vast, I don't know, prairies of whatever kind of land in the game, right? <laughs> um, kind of geeking out right here. So, hey guys, if there's any questions, like, please feel free, eh? Don't be shy. Well, how about it? Got any questions, Tom? I sure don't. I love how quick you're doing everything, not focusing at all on the details, just getting, you know, the action across and the intention of, of each frame, just capturing very, very quick um, actions that tell us the bigger story. And I'm this very sad to say, but Photoshop just froze on me. And it's a typical thing that happens when you use the, 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 the Marquis tool. So in, yes. order to not, in order to not lose what we just did right now, I'm gonna take a screenshot because I've learned to. Uh, <laughs> it happens. Uh, this is a bummer, but you know, I've happened so many times that I don't lose sleep over it. Oops. Um, hey, where'd it go? No, cancel. What is going on? Even my screen capture tool doesn't work. Of all things to happen, I really apologize for that, guys. No, don't worry about it. I think you were almost wrapping up that, that part of the class. We're almost at two hours as well. So really we're going, yeah, oh. it is. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're, let me- We're almost at two hours. We're gonna have to wrap it up. We have other things to tend to, and we are going to probably, again, bring you back because we haven't you know, covered a lot of the things that I want you to cover because it's such an extensive subject, right? Um, yeah. Storytelling, how to set up your, your tools for success. And you know, then we have to get into deeper storytelling, you know, uh, how to, really like do your, your mood sets and your character, how they're going to re re relate to the space and all of that. I would love to bring you back, Nick. I know that you have an extensive class um, or more topics to, to discuss, especially um, how to develop these sketches and how to um, polish them to- Taking it to the next level. Taking yeah. it to the next level, making it easier for the next person in the pipeline to take over. Um, so let's bring you back. We're almost at two hours. We're going to post this on YouTube for anybody who didn't get a chance to join us today. We're going to have this live on YouTube la la later on today. And I will 
uh, invite my friend Patricio to bring you back so that we can continue to learn more from you, Nick. Any um, <laughs> advice you may have um, as we wrap up this webinar for any aspiring uh, concept artists out there interested in, in, you know, going into the gaming industry like yourself? Um, just the best advice that I can give is honestly, um, investigate. One of the main things I always tell my, uh, my, my past students, I go, guys, always stay curious, right? Always ask questions. Um, stay curious in terms of like, oh, how do I, how can you do this technique or, you know, reaching out to artists or even investigating yourself on how you can reach a next level of craftsmanship. Um, because in what we do, or like in any kind of artistic field, there's the technical aspect and then there's the creative aspect and then there's the draftsmanship aspect, right? The technical aspect is understanding, okay, well, what are the best tools to use or single tool? The craft is understanding what concept art or design is used for, right? If you understand the vehicle and what, what the tool is used for, because what we do, is a tool to aid production in visualizing a product, okay? We're part of a bigger machine. We're part of a bigger system of, of team players that really rely and depend on each other. Like, I don't just rely on this particular person. That person will rely on me to deliver something. You know, it's, it's a, it's a well-oiled machine, right? So if you understand and kind of research or even talk to people or watch interviews on YouTube, there's a load of information out there about what to expect. And it's just a matter of finding it. Um, now, in regards to the actual artwork, figure out what you're passionate about, right? Like if you love doing, you want to world build, it's a very extensive thing to say, but world building could be just as simple as like, I want to just do props that you know, communicate what exists in this world. Now, these props can be sci-fi vehicles. They could be, uh, they could be even robots. I mean, or mechanical AI, or you know, like even just like a, a medieval-looking fancy Viking candlestick on a table. But something as as big as like you know, in, working on environments. Um, and the environments could be, hey, I'm a specialist at doing exteriors. And there's even specialists that work creating interiors because they have like an interior design background or they have an interest in interior design. Um, you know, there's so many layers of these, these specialties um, and even genres, you know, like if you're like really into stylized work like Blizzard and, and um, uh, what are some of the other game companies? Um, uh, these valves with Dota, you know, Dota 2. Um, understanding the kind of product, is it a top view? Is it a first person shooter? Is it a puzzle solving game? There's so many different layers now and opportunities of creativity that you can actually say, okay, I like to work with environments that cater to this kind of style or genre, right? Um, and the same goes with characters. It, it, it applies in the same manner. Um, stylistically, you know, uh, periodically, are you more, or genre-wise, are you like fantasy, do you like sci-fi, do you just wanna do sci-fi, right? Then there are people that just focus on that and specialize on that. So it's a matter as a student to figure out, okay, you know, what really motivates you and what are you passionate about? And just say, you know what, like tunnel vision, go for it, like aim for that. Um, investigate and, and just fuel your curiosity as much as possible on a creative level, on an informative level, and on a technical level. So, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, right some on. of the advice. <laughs> that's amazing advice. Thank you so much for simply, like, really explaining and um, breaking it down because content development is something that a, a little bit... Um, not clear or it touches on so many disciplines that it, it's hard to explain as you know what what it is that they do and the importance but you just explained it so well that i appreciate it thank you so much nick my and pleasure thank you, thank you so much to welcome canada thank you to my team for staying for two hours and we will 
definitely be talking more about concept development later on. We'll bring back Nick and maybe we can have a panel where we have multiple um, concept artists talk about um, what they do and the different, because there's all kinds, right? I just, uh, you, you, you focus on, on environments and, and backgrounds. There's some that concept artists that just fo focus on costumes and let's uh, maybe have a deeper dive and discussion. Thank you so much, Nick. Th thank you, Tom. I believe this webinar is a wrap. My pleasure. And thanks a lot, guys, for having me uh, be a part of this. Thank you, Nick. We'll, we'll be in touch soon. And thank you, everyone, for watching. This is Wacom Webinars for one other session. Let's see what happens next week. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye. Ciao.